Today, we're talking about uh, continuing on this di uh, the divine direction, following in that journey. Our decision to define our legacy will be remembered for the things we've decided or left undecided. Sometimes we fear the outcome of decisions, you know, of our own decisions. That, that is why we look for divine directions. So far, we've, we've learned that God is most interested in who we are more than what we do and, and more interested in why we do things than what those things actually are. Last week, we also learned that God won't decide for us. God will give us wisdom to decide for our else, self. So if we ask God, we can ask to walk in God's way, and God will give us that wisdom. And today, what this series, by the way, is based on Craig Rochelle's book, which is called Divine Direction. If you want to uh, read that book or study some more on this, it's under divinedirection.com. You can buy the book. And even if a few of you want to get together and have a class maybe and talk about that together, just let me know and I'll make that happen. And I'll be, if I can, I'll be a part of that as well. It'd be fun to do that. But today we continue on this road of divine direction uh, as we talk about trusting the process. Has anybody here ever participated in a trust fall? You know what I mean by a trust fall where you cross your arms and there's someone behind you and you drop back? Anybody ever do that? Was that fun or what? Huh? If, especially if you're in the back, not in the front, dropping into someone's arms. And, and there's, there's always that time when you go to a trust fall that you have to trust the person behind you. Well, imagine now, and you know they're back there, right? You know that they're there. They're physically there. Imagine what it's like to trust your entire life, your very, uh, your very self uh, to God's direction, to the great God of the universe that we can't see. At least most of us can't. And if you can, tell us about it sometime. That's, that's what we're going to challenge ourselves to do today is to trust, to fall into God's process of divine direction. Let's pray. God, we do not always trust. We sing the song, Trust and Obey. We sing of your glories, and we know of your glories, and we have this short-term memory problem, because if we certainly look at how you have impacted our lives, we know we can trust. But today, Lord, we want to be better at it. We want to trust this process of following you, this process of divine direction. And so we ask that you would step into this place as you do faithfully each week with us and inspire us with your way, with your wisdom, with your process. In Jesus we pray. Amen. We're not always good decision makers. We've talked about that. Uh, the cacophony of voices offering advice today, especially now in the digital age, we're, we're becoming less and less decisive because there's too many choices. We are flooded with options. Michelle and I, I told you our, our recent car buying experience, well, for the first time it included the digital world as part of the process of looking at cars. And, and so we decided we, Michelle had gone online and, and found several cars that we wanted to look at, used cars that were in our range that we could do something with. And so we, we went with all this wisdom of the digital age in our pockets and took off and started going to car dealerships. And, and, and I, the very first thing that happened was I got into Michelle's car, the one we're keeping, and the starter was dead. So we had to take old Tom's car, the 230,000 mile car. And it was doing great. Only there were several places over in Orlando because 
because that's where all the digital cars were. And about halfway there, the air conditioning stopped working. And so before we ever got to our first car dealership, we went to a parts store. And I'm very good at putting Freon into cars because I, it's kind of like gas. I have to fill it up every so often. And so it, that's, that was our start into this new body. And this is, the, again, this is the car we're keeping. Oh, good. And, 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 and so the, that car's sitting dead at home and we're looking for a new car. And then we get there and some of them were really easy um, because I have this thing about needing to see the traffic lights. I'm six foot one. And when I pull up to uh, a traffic light in certain cars, I can't see. So we decided we'd go out and figure out which those cars were out of this group of, of great deals on the digital line. And so some car dealerships, we would go in and I would just sit down in the car, look up and say, nope. Didn't have to take it for a drive. I knew I couldn't see the traffic light. So why would I get that car? My, my wife bought a car. We bought a car that for our kids to use. And Alyssa has it at school right now. And it's, it's a subcompact. And I learned that particular day that every subcompact car that is made won't do. I'm too tall. I just can't do it. I can, uh, if I put the seat back, the one guy, oh my gosh, he was so nice. He was at one of the car dealerships and he was so nice and he was worried that, that, that he was going to help me out and he was going to help me see that the car could. And he showed me and he put the seat back a little bit and pulled it all the way back and pumped it down. You know, the new cars had that little pump down thing. And I could, I could see. And I was like, yeah, that's good. And then I decided, well, I better see how much room there is for my kids in the back. And there was that much for leg room. Still didn't work. So, and, and the worst part of it is, is that I'm an amiable person. So every one of these car dealerships that we went to, people, I disappointed people because I didn't buy that car. And, and so all of those things begin to be decision things that become, and now Michelle is much more involved in the details. She went out and she has a page full, an eight and a half by 11 scribbled in every direction, every car, what the mileage is, what year it is, and what, everything about it, except for the, whether it was a subcompact or not. We didn't know that then. But, and then so we went out and we had all this information and we just couldn't we couldn't get there. And I wasn't sure that we were ever going to do uh, anything with it. We had all this information and we just, and me, I just want to go in and say, okay, I'll take that one. I've done that before. I've actually had a friend that was a dealer and I just would call them and say, can you get me a car and I'll meet you halfway. I was in Miami one time and I drove this, oh, this car that they had to drive back home. I don't know how they did it, but I switched cars with them on the turnpike because that's the car I was going to buy. I just did it. Well, that's not, you can tell that's not Michelle's way of doing things. So we have decision problems all over the place. Neither one of us, Michelle nor I, wanted to make the wrong decision. So we spent an entire day driving around, looking at cars and saying no and Finally, we did buy one, but decisions are hard. Amen? Amen? Sorry, I didn't mean to get so carried away. Now, additionally, we have this other problem. COVID-19 has brought about this epidemic known as decision fatigue. Decision fatigue is that idea that after making many decisions, a person's ability to make additional decisions becomes worse. Hasn't that been the case for the last year? Should I go in there? Should I wash my hands? Should I breathe? Should I not? What should I do? We've, we've been through all of that. The psychological effects of decision fatigue can vary, potentially leading to difficulty making the right decision. So we have troubles making these decisions. Or sometimes we'll just impulse buy or another will have avoidance behavior. Do you think you struggle with making decisions? Anybody? Yeah, did you just kind of still trying to decide if you should have come here today is what? Yeah, sorry. There are so many more options today in buying cars too, like, you know, like CarMax, Carvana, and all the good fleet dealers that we've always known. And you have an idea, but you think that's bad. Have you paid attention? Well, we probably haven't, most of us, have, but paid attention about dating I remember when I was a kid, I had, to, I had to decide if I was going to go out with this girl or this girl. And usually only there was just one girl. So there was really only one this. And I had to decide if I was going to ask her out or not. And that's the way it is. But today, 
You just go swipe, 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 and you can spend the rest of your life looking for your date. It can be that way. There's just a thousand people out there. There are so many decisions out there. There's so much that's built up into it. And we want to be perfect when we make that decision. You know who teaches us that? Matthew McConaughey. Have you ever seen Matthew McConaughey get into his Lincoln? It's like a zen-like moment, right? Have you ever gotten a car and felt as good as Matthew McConaughey has? No, that's because you haven't made the perfect decision yet. See, we want to make perfect decisions. It can't be done. There's so much build up in our minds about decisions, and we can get stalled in making a decision. And it's true in our faith walk as well. We know who we are meant to be. We know that God gives us wisdom to decide, but we have to trust the process, God's process for divine direction. What does it take to trust process? Well, let's look into the scripture. Today, I want to look at Paul. Paul loved the church in Ephesus. His, his letter to the Ephesians is full of love and care for the church. You can hear it in his, in his words. You can feel the love in his words, his affirmations, his hopes for them. He, he loved working with them. But there came a point when he had to move on, when he had other places to be. And I can relate how difficult that can be. But Paul trusted the process. Listen to his heart's words, felt his heartfelt words from Acts 22, beginning in verse 22. Uh, Acts 20, verse 22. And now, as a captive to the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish the course of, and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. Paul gives us in this two, three uh, verses, gives us the architecture of God's process and how to exceed, how to succeed in trusting the process. It begins with the Spirit. That sense of God's presence. The passage says, as captive to the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. The word captive is a little misleading. It's probably not the best word. The Greek word suggests to be bound to something. It's not that Paul was being held captive. Paul was bound to God's will. And trusting takes being bound to God's leading. Trusting takes being bound to God's leading. That means when we feel that sense, when we have been given that wisdom and we have this leading, we have to go with it. Amen? That is the beginning point. We all need to have that. We don't, we don't shake it off. That comes from doubt. And I talked about doubt last week. Doubt is not of God. God is faithful in all times and all places. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, God still remains faithful. One thing I'm sure of is that God has always been there for me. When the Spirit speaks, that is the binding. That is what stuck Paul to the leading of the Spirit. To trust the process, we need to remember that God always has our best in mind. Jeremiah 17 says it beautifully. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by the water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when the heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious and does not cease to bear fruit. Doesn't that sound beautiful? That's how God... That's the faithfulness of God right there in those passages. Just when, no matter what we go through, God is there with us. So the process calls us to be bound to the Spirit of God because of God's love for us. Is there anyone, Matthew 7, 9 says, is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give you a stone? When the Spirit speaks, tune in and be 
bound to that process because God loves us. Because God, we think we're good parents. God is the ultimate parent and will give us exactly what we need. Not what we want always, but what we need. And so we have to trust and be bound to that leading that God has in our lives. Do you know what I'm talking about, that leading? Have you felt it before? Have you felt it in this room before? I I think we all have those moments where we feel God's leading in our lives. And And if you're having trouble with it, trust in it. That's what it calls us to do. Paul goes on to let us know in in these leadings, in these following, in this process, there is uncertainty. He says, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. When, when we step towards God, we step in faith. We step into the unknown. We fall back into God's arms in the trust fall. That's where we're called to go. But God's got a plan, and it will unfold step by step. That's what I believe is happening here and on our way as we trust this process. We step into the unknown. Something I learned about carrying coffee a long time ago. I used to be a floor boy at the Glen Park Cafeteria in Chautauqua, New York. If you don't look, it's hot right? Table, as long as you don't look at it, it, you will overreact and hot liquid will go either on you or someone that you want to tip from someday. Amen? So, So that's the same way in this leading of the Spirit, I think. I think we're called to to not look back and not to look deeply into it, but just just to trust the process. It's natural for us to look and say, "Uh uh-oh, because that's what we do. Don't you, when you coffee, if you think, oh, it's going to spill, I better watch it spill. How does that help? What part of your brain helps when you look at the coffee? It doesn't. Unless you have turned your... No. But that's, that's what God calls us to do, is to trust the process and to, and to understand even when we don't know where we're going, it's going to work. If there's uncertainty, I think the better choice may be to shout, Jeremiah 29! Jeremiah 29! And keep going with the process. What does Jeremiah 29, 11 say? Jeremiah, for the surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. Let uncertainty pass with the certain hope of God. I have to often have to say that when we follow God's plan, there will be an oppositional force of evil. I call it the Monday morning pushback to our office. You've heard me talk about that before. When good things happen, there seems to be a, a negative thing that happens in the world. When good things happen, like the, like the vaccine looks like it's starting to take place in the world, look what happened in Israel this weekend. And keep that in your prayers, please. But things happen. The Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city, Paul says, that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. Paul knew there was going to be opposition. God's direction, divine direction, is never the easy way. Matthew seven fourteen says, The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. Part of the process of overcoming the opposition is we must be willing to face the oppositions. The best decisions I've made in ministry have come with adverse effect. When we chose to take over Christ Church and it became Derbyshire Place, the day we voted on that, 30 people walked out the door of this church to not return. In South Miami, my appointment before this one, a plan to begin a holistic after-school ministry was met with a clandestine meeting where people were invited to sign in, and the actual sign-in sheet was photocopied to the bottom of a letter to the bishop, presuming that the entire church was saying that I, Tom Nelson, was ruining the church because I wanted to use one of the holy spaces 
for holistic ministry for kids. It was the darkest time in ministry to date for me. I have to admit that. Godly decisions have consequences. It has to be why Jesus says to his disciples in John 16, in the world you will face persecution, but take courage because I have conquered the world. I'm still here. <laughs> After all that, I'm still here. And I'm here to tell you it was and is. And listen, it will always be worth it. Listening to God, stepping into the opposition, falling into uncertainty, it will always be worth it because it's God's plan. Craig Rochelle says, resistance isn't a sign you are out of God's will. In fact, it might be an indication you are doing exactly what God wants you to do. 2 Timothy 3.14, but as for you, continue what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you believed it. Trusting the process takes confidence. Confidence comes from a Latin word that means to have full trust. When, when we trust the process, what makes it work from the moment the Spirit speaks through the uncertainty and the opposition is confidence. I know my God. Not the self-confidence alone, but, but the first, the confidence in God. Paul had come to know that full trust in God as he said, I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. Above all else, Paul trusted the process because he knew the grace of divine direction. In this world, we are going to face persecution, especially as God leads us forward. Sometimes these days, the gate is narrow. There are opposing voices and, and uncertainty squeezing into our way, and we just keep thinking, oh, and we, as we seek to live out the will, will of God, we need to remember what the scripture said. What can flesh do to me? What can man do to me? Take heart. Trust the process. For Christ has conquered the world. If we don't trust what we are becoming in Christ, then we're doing it wrong. Do you hear me? We're doing again instead of being. That's where God reminds us that I have conquered the world. If what we are doing doesn't feel right, figure out the why. Be bound to the Spirit of God. Seek God's wisdom. And with the confidence of Christ in our very being, we find God's way. God's way. The divine direction. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whoever is born of God conquers the world. And is, this is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith. There is only one option. There's really only one option that is divine. Trust the process. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you all